Welcome back. I know it's been a little while. Today I'm talking to Vicky van der Tote and Dr. Jeremy Rossman about why an acid-base imbalance might be the missing link to understanding what's causing long COVID. They explain how it fits into the well-established pathophysiology, including inflammation, poor oxygen, and abnormal clotting, as well as how it could cause the much suspected doom loop the body finds it so hard to break out of. What I find particularly fascinating is how it would also explain all sorts of perplexing symptoms such as muscle weakness, post-exertional symptom exacerbation, and that soul-crushing fatigue. Because one thing's for sure, it sure as hell isn't deconditioning. Let's dive in. So hi Vicky, Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'd like if both of you could just give me each a sort of a 30 second sort of pressy of what your backgrounds are. So Vicky, let's start with you. I got infected in March 2020, um, have been struggling with long COVID for a very long time. Um, I've been reinfected quite a couple of times uh, in the meantime as well. Didn't get much help in, in terms of you know, going to doctors, uh, getting any type of examinations or even being referred for examinations. In that same period of time, I went online, got into advocacy, uh, met Dr. Jeremy Rossman, uh, at the end of 2020, and we paired up, uh, did a whole lot of uh, research together, and also uh, did a lot of things to help other researchers as well as uh, support long COVID groups throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, so what's what's your background, Jeremy? So my background so is my in background. immunology and virology. I have a, was a full-time senior lecturer in virology at the University of Kent for many years. Now I'm an honorary senior lecturer in virology at the University of Kent. I'm the president of the nonprofit organization Research Aid Networks. And, you know, we do a lot of sort of scientific communication and bridging that gap between what is going on in the community and what is going on in sort of academic research and academic science. And that brought me into the long COVID field really to sort of help a lot of different groups and organizations really sort of bridge that gap and facilitate the communication. Unfortunately, during that time, I also got infected with COVID and developed long COVID myself and really got to see firsthand how absolutely debilitating it can be. And so that really, you know, crystallized sort of my take on long COVID, but also really sort of facilitated this further research into long COVID that we really started looking at and really trying to develop and brings us to where we are today. Indeed. So this the sort of hypothesis paper you wrote about the sort of supposing that an acid base imbalance might be behind possibly all <laughs> of the condition and might explain why it is this sort of multi-system, multifactorial, enigmatic, 207 symptom ridden condition. If you can relatively concisely talk us through the logic about what you think is going on in terms of a sort of the cascade of how we end up with A, acid base imbalance into finally Z symptoms. Yes. Okay. I, I will try and do this as succinctly as possible, but you know, anything pertaining to long COVID ends up being so <laughs> wide that it's really difficult to do it short. But the, you know, there have been a lot of different hypotheses to what's going on on with long COVID, what's causing the symptoms. And there's very good evidence for all of that. You know, we know that there's persistent inflammation and dysregulated inflammation. We know that there's issues with microvascular circulation and clotting, all of which can, you know, cause local, at least localized, if not sometimes systemic hypoxia and low oxygen environments. We also know that in a lot of people, there is residual tissue damage from the acute infection. So there's very good evidence that all of that is going on, and it may be continually driven by persistent virus or persistent viral proteins. That is a little bit less definitive right now, but I think that it's probably quite likely. Now, what we think, where we sort of come into play here, is that this sort of localized or systemic hypoxia changes how cells and tissues basically use energy. And it changes metabolism going from 
aerobic, which uses oxygen and generates is quite efficient to anaerobic, which doesn't use oxygen and is less efficient, but it also has a side effect of generating more acid. And we think that in a large scale, either localized in individual tissues or throughout the whole body, that this excess acid can really cause this acid base imbalance. It can stress the system and it can lead to many of the symptoms that we see in long COVID. But we have the added part here that the virus itself can also reprogram cells shifting them towards anaerobic respiration. So we have a dual factor coming in here that is all shifting towards this anaerobic respiration that has a consequence of generating more acid. Now, we're not saying at all that, you know, inflammation isn't going on, that clotting isn't going on, that there isn't these issues with microvascular circulation. That is all very clear. But we think what's happening is that you're getting this feedback loop because excess acid and this acid-base imbalance can also affect clotting, can also affect inflammation, can also affect circulation. So you have this reiterative cycle where all of these are ongoing, but they're reinforcing each other potentially over time, maybe through continued viral input, or maybe just through this really vicious cycle. So how do you go about testing your theory? Well, there are a couple, you, you can have sort of like a whole range, everything from relatively simple to incredibly rigorous. But with long COVID, we know how variable it is. We know that it's variable within a person over time. We know that it's variable from person to person. And so, you know, that's one of the crucial things is that if you go and test something in a long COVID patient, you know, it's a point in time. And so either you need a large number of patients or you need patients that are doing more longitudinal tracking. And so that's one really important thing. And so there are a lot of different ways to track it that we talk about in the paper. You can do sort of lactate blood testing that is a proxy. It's not a definitive proof of the pH change, but it's a proxy for it. You can do things like looking at muscle oxygen saturation, and you can do sort of both of those over time. You can also do clinical work where you actually do blood draws and you check what the actual pH is. You can check how the body responds to something like a six minute walk test. There are a lot of different ways that you can get at this. Some of that sort of data has been in, you know, little bits from different experiments in the past. A lot of that data is being talked about by patients right now. So it does sort of feed into a lot that's already been published. But what we really need is rigorous control. We need patients that, you know, ideally haven't been infected, although you're probably not going to find that, but at least patients that have fully recovered, patients maybe with a short-term long COVID, patients with long-term long COVID, different range of symptoms, and really you need that longitudinal tracking to understand what's going on and how that correlates with symptoms. So Vicky, I know you've spoken on Twitter about um People sort of uh, people have been asking. Well, I had my blood test and it came back normal. My pH was normal. My lactate was normal, etc. How could you just talk a little bit, um, or Jeremy, about about how the body might compensate and why it might be that sometimes these results aren't as obvious to to find or to look for as they might be? The body will always try to keep a steady age. You know, the pH level of the body will be between seven point thirty five and seven point forty five, and so. Whenever you have a, a rise in acidity, then the body will try to compensate, for example, by changing the breeding pattern. You, you can get rid of excess acid through the urine. So by you know, increasing your amount of water intake, um, you can actually try to lower that acidity as well. When you go to a doctor and you get your blood test, um, well, that's only a one-time test. And so, like Jeremy said just now, these levels will fluctuate over time. And so that's why in the paper, we also say we need continuous testing to be able to really you know, show those fluctuations. Uh, and that's really what we've seen uh, in, you know, did the, we did testing on ourselves as well. 
And we did that over the course of the day and in different types of situations. And what we saw was really that it fluctuates so much over time that it became clear to me that if I were to go, even with the, because for example, I did lactate testing on myself and, and it showed really high levels, really within the range of acidosis. But whenever I did a short walk or I did testing right after going to the bathroom, for example, these levels would be normal. And so it really occurred to me that if I were to have my lactate tested at, at a doctor's office, that would be, my levels would probably be normal because I would just have walked, for, for example, or I would have just gone to the bathroom. And so it makes all the difference. And so that's something to really keep in mind. I was just going to say one additional point is that we talk about that acidosis that may be localized to the tissue, or it may be, you know, in the blood. And so when you go to the doctor's office, and you get a, you know, a blood test, you know, first of all, when they test for pH, that's usually arterial blood. And then, you know, if they're testing for lactate, maybe it's venous blood, but it's not a finger prick. It's not looking at the microcirculation and it's not looking at all at what's happening in the tissue. So it might be that if they had actually looked at, you know, what is the lactate levels in the tissue, you'd see something totally different than what you're seeing in the blood. So that that's an added component there. So, so where are you guys at in terms of actually putting something together to try and test this. Are you are you on the case trying to put together some sort of trial or, or to try and build some evidence base for it? Yes, definitely. Um, so one thing that I just need to mention uh, is that from the moment that we published, there was this immediate spur online of people wanting to do this lactate testing as well. And so there's actually been a, a worldwide patient-led project uh, started of patients you know, buying up these gigantic amounts of lactate meters and shipping them all over the world. And so patients all over the world are currently testing their lactate levels and they're actually like confirming our hypothesis, which has just been amazing to see. And we already see patients who have been able to go to their doctor with these raised levels and have been able to get treatment and are doing so much better ever since. Um, so that's just one thing that I wanted to mention because it's just it's been fantastic to see this this immediate response to it. Uh, but in terms of testing it ourselves, we are currently planning a clinical trial, um, which will of course consist of the the specific hypothesis testing paragraph that we we have in a paper, uh, as well as potentially testing different interventions. Um, of course, like every other research team, uh, we need to get funding for that as well. And so we have some funding, but dependent on the amount of funding that we can get, we can either have that have more components to that clinical trial or, or keep it a little bit limited. Uh, so that's where we're at right now, very much in the planning phase, but hopefully getting started as soon as possible. So is there anything around the theory that you're intrigued about that you haven't quite, like where you'd desperately like to dig further? There, there is no shortage to that answer. The, uh, yeah. you know, the, there is not a big enough shovel to, to dig for all that. There's a lot on the sort of detailed, specific mechanism, you know, exactly what is the, the virus doing that's causing this, exactly, you know, what is going on at the individual cell or tissue level. You know, hugely interesting um, unanswered questions. We have a lot of observations of that, and we have some molecular details. But there's there's some bridging there that would be really interesting to see how it happens. Um, you know, how this applies to you know other post viral illnesses is another really interesting okay. question. Um, Definitely. Also, so much of this, how this acid base imbalance affects you know, so many different bodily processes. And there, there's sort of, there's a lot of pieces there that haven't really been studied in as much detail. Some of that we know really well, but some of it we don't. And so, you know, when you start to get to the brain or the CNS, we know that, you know, acid-base imbalance can have a really big impact there, but how the brain uses energy sources and metabolizes is different from a lot of other cells in the body. So, you know, it's it's there's a lot that's missing and of course you know it's not easy to go test uh, lactate or ph in the brain you know it's a much more difficult area to assay so 
there's a lot of interesting things, a lot of unanswered questions um, for, uh, for the long run. Hope you found that interesting. Next up will be part two of the interview, where we discuss which interventions one might test in light of the acid base hypothesis. Interestingly, they wouldn't necessarily need any fancy drugs. Look after yourselves. Until next time.